So thank you, everybody, for coming. We really do appreciate it. And I just want to thank uh, Desha for some of her work to get people here and to get the word out, and also Aaron Moore to help us get Sean and Sarah here as well. Um, my name is uh, Nat Bingham, and I am the Global Health Representative for NMSA at, at NCNM. And this is kind of one of the events we're trying to put on, and we're always trying to find things that students are interested about so we can learn more about global health and international medicine and how naturopathic medicine can play a role in that scene. So um, I'd like to introduce Sean Hessler and um, Sarah, Sarah Hessler as well. And they are married. They're both naturopathic doctors, and they've been practicing medicine um, naturopathic medicine in Haiti for the past seven months, and we're so excited for them to be there. So, I'd like to give them a big round, a big warm welcome. Okay. So it should be recording. Cool. And then just when I have it just a little bit lower. All right. And you think we can kind of clip it. Like there. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes? Okay, I have a quiet voice, so. Oh, missing my clip. Uh oh. Oh no. Where'd he go? You guys can fast forward through this part. Hold on. That's all right, I'll wing it. Alrighty. We just had uh, grand rounds at SCNM that we gave, and we had like horrible feedback issues, ear piercing. Oh man, horrible. Let's hope we don't do that again. Okay, uh, I am Sean Hessler, and I'm Sarah Preston Hessler. And uh, like they said, we just worked with Mom Baby Haiti for seven months. And we also did a lot of work with Natural Pass Without Borders. We're still very involved in Natural Pass Without Borders. Going through school, we did the Rocky Point trips um, very often. And um, I also run, along with Dr. Mary Kay Geyer, the Naturopathic Global Medicine Network listserv, which is quite inactive right now, but it's, it's picking up a bit now that we're back. And uh, in 2007, I was the Public Health Trek co-chair for NMSA along with Jacal Patterson, who's really awesome. And that is now basically your position. So you kind of turned into that. So also involved with NMSA in the past. Um, and the purpose of our talk is not to tell you about NWB and Mom Baby Haiti and share all these stories, but we want to help to prepare you to become a global health doctor, which you already are, even though you don't realize it and you don't have the letters before your name yet. Um, so we just want to talk about some different things to think about and getting yourself prepared and working with an organization and getting your skills up, hopefully, before you graduate, getting some experience, as well as kind of navigating the minefield that is naturopathic medicine and global health. So let's get rolling. Oh, you've got the clicker. Oh, jeez. I'm sneaky. It's got a laser on there, too. Know, gotta be careful. So cool. All right. Um, so just a brief overview of the talk, preparing yourself for career in global health, different ways to approach global health. Again, this is really cursory to cover all this in two hours. We're going to have to skip a lot. So, um, You'll all have access to the notes, too. I'm going to get into Nat somehow. And the clinical crash course as well, um, you'll all have access to that somehow. I don't know if you're passing it around or what. Different tools, and we'll go through some diseases, because that's what everyone wants to hear about. So. All right, so first, um, skill-wise, you are going to know a lot more than you think when you graduate. You're going to be really shell-shocked when you start seeing your first few patients, and oh my god, and I don't have a doctor that I can go and report to, and what happens if there's an emergency or something really crazy like that? You're way better off than you think, and you just gotta kinda trust your instincts, look stuff up when you don't know it. So fill the gaps in your knowledge. Um, we were quite weak in dermatology, and so we had to read some derm stuff. And you might be amazed to find that when you go into a country with a lot of dark people that you won't find pictures of dark people dermatology very easily because you learn white people dermatology. Mm -hmm. 
And I think I heard um, at best year that uh, Sabine Thomas was teaching a class on that, actually. So that would be good. You don't have to be great at everything, but have a good base, be good at diagnosis, and have a couple of your favorite modalities that you use. Think about game planning for some different illnesses that you're going to see for your specific target area. We knew we were going to see worms, so we studied a lot on worms, and we saw a lot of worms. So that really helped. Um, here's some books that I highly recommend that we refer to regularly. And um, I, I recommend them too. She recommends them too. <laughs> and uh, I would say that that's kind of the minimum set that I would bring with me. So. You want me to do this one? Sure. Okay. Um, so your most important asset is experience. Get as much experience as you can. Shadow doctors, go on trips. Um, just practice as many, as many of your skills as you can. Get your stethoscopes on people's chest. Hear as many different heart sounds as you can. As I'm sure you've learned in your classes, if you know what normal is, then you can know what abnormal is. So even if you don't know how to diagnose a heart murmur, you can say, okay, I know this isn't normal. I can send it to someone else. Um, work with NWB and other organization, organizations as much as you can. There are many trips that are available. Um, Sean can get you a list of different opportunities that, and groups that will accept naturopaths and naturopathic students if any of you are interested. Although, Aaron, did you post that on it's the, on the NMSA NMSA website? website? It's right? already up there. Great. Okay. So go look there. Don't regret not having gone on trips. Many people graduate and say, I wish I had gone on trips, and they regret it. So do it while you can. Um, take good care of yourself. I was sick a lot in Haiti. There were new bugs. I felt like a first-year teacher who gets every cold that every child has. I seem to get every other infectious disease that's out there. Um, don't live in your clinic. Try to have some time away. We didn't really have time away, and that was hard. Um, do things that, that interest you, that keep your mind off of your patients and off of your work, because it's easy to get really sucked in. Um, so Sean bought a motorcycle, I bought a keyboard, and those were our little activities that we could do to keep us sane. Eat well as much as you can. Uh, you all know how to do that. You're experts in that. Research vaccinations. Decide before you go what you're going to do as far as the vaccinations, and just consider would I have the opportunity to be treated if I did contract this disease. Uh, these are some supplements that we recommend. You can pretty much read through them yourself, but... The, the one that I really want to point out is the Da Vinci Reds and Purples. We, there were no berries or really any antioxidant-rich fruits in Haiti, and so we took the Da Vinci Reds and Purples and made little shakes out of them just to get some more nutrients. And that multivitamin is awesome. It has probiotics and greens in it, and that's probably why I never had diarrhea or anything. He's also I, better at taking things than I am. <laughs> consistency, consistency. And for the eating well part, the Hardest part to get in developing countries is protein, which is why you're going to see a lot of protein malnutrition, which we'll talk about in a little while. And think about growing beans, think about bringing protein powder, getting chickens for eggs and meat and things like that. Probably gonna be kind of hard to do this if you're, if you're a vegan, so. Financing the dream. So a lot of people ask us how we're able to be new graduates, a married couple, we both have loans. How can we just go off and do this? And fortunately, there are programs out there that help a little bit. It's not as good as what an MD would get after graduating, but it's a start. So there's income-based repayment, which they take your income and calculate your payment based on that. And so it's not $1,400 a month per person. It's maybe zero or $25 or $50 or whatever. So it's a lot more achievable. And then there's the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program. This is really important if you want to do global health. Basically, it allows you to work for a nonprofit for 10 years, making 120 payments. So maybe you could get the IBR and then qualify for the Public Service Loan Forgiveness. If you meet those requirements, making 120 payments, then you, the rest of your loans will be forgiven. So that's pretty huge. All the, in, all the info is on ibrinfo.org. Um, also look into passive income options. We considered purchasing a tap tap, which is the, um, it's basically like a shelled out pickup truck. And then they put benches on the side of the back, cover it, and then 30 people will cram in the back. And that's how they drive around <laughs> in Haiti. And so um, we considered purchasing one. It would also 
you know, give Haiti another tap tap because there were so few and people were having trouble getting them when they needed to go places and it would give us a little passive income as well. Another great read is the four hour work week. It talks about ways to achieve passive income so that you can live the life that you want to live and not be a slave to your job. So. And we had, we had talked with a, a friend of ours that we made who's a nurse at St. Francois Hospital and she works with Catholic Medical Mission Board and they don't allow you to make any other money. So that's more difficult if you're going with an organization like that. So that might be a consideration. Um, we asked Santo, our head translator, for some tips on um, helping you work better with the translator and also finding a good translator. So um, they're pretty self-explanatory, but sometimes it's really hard to remember these, especially when you're a new student or a new doc working in the clinic and you're trying to think of differentials and treatments and what you're going to ask next and oh this is way over my head and you might not remember some very basic things for working with a translator so ask your translator to translate verbatim and in the patient's own language at their own level also speak that way with the translator most errors in translation are your fault is because you didn't ask something clearly maybe asked a really too open-ended question when you meant to be more specific or vice versa. We found that we had to ask more closed-ended questions in Haiti than in the United States because they just wouldn't give you a whole lot. So you'd have to maybe ask, you know, have you seen worms in the poop, yes or no? Instead of being like, what does your poop look like? Because they're always like, it's yellow. And you're like, wow, they're that's like, really what weird. What kind of question is that? Yeah. Your poop, it's too, normal. will be yellow in Haiti, whether you want it or not. Really, it will. Like, your flora changes. It's not just plantains. I don't know. Um, yeah, so really speaking clearly, um, the other main thing that we ran into in Haiti was timelines. Sometimes a patient would come in or a really concerned, over-concerned mother, and child looks pretty healthy, not in any apparent distress, and then the mom gives you eight things wrong with the kid. They've got belly aches and headaches, and he skinned his knee, and oh, he has malaria and worms. And then it turns out like half those things were a year ago, and they're gone. So the first thing you do, you know, in your OPQRST, your onset, get the onset and the duration right away, because you might waste a lot of time asking about things that are in the past. They might say that they have worms, ask when they were last treated for worms. Might have been like three weeks ago, and they haven't seen any since then. You could spend a whole lot of time tr like trying to figure out what kind of worm it is, and it doesn't matter. Um, there's there's this uh, line that I think I think naturopaths walk more more skillfully than most MDs I've seen, being kind of like kind and jovial but professional at the same time. It it can really lighten people up if you use a little bit of humor, not to make fun of their condition or anything, but you know, like a if there's like a translational error. Sometimes the translator would say something funny and we'd laugh and we'd be like, no, 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 we weren't laughing at you. We're just, they said this and then they'll laugh and then you know, maybe they'll tell you a little more because you're on their side and you're not just this white devil or something like that. Okay, a good translator um, is going to speak both languages well. The nuances can be really important. Um, in Haiti, for instance, there's one word for chest and stomach. So there were all these cases of chest pain that we were like, oh no, cardiac or GERD or whatever, and they really just meant they had epigastric pain, like they were hungry. And so again, we wasted a lot of time not knowing the nuances of the language there. Um, helps if they have certification or a lot of experience in medical translation, not just translation, or if you're doing births, doing births. And Santo had done uh, about 45 births by the time we had worked with him. And it was a huge difference him and then other people who had come in to work and they didn't know the terminology, they had to study a lot more and he already knew it. He could do four births at a time because he is awesome. <laughs> and I sold him my motorcycle, so <laughs> I trust him. Um, they have to care personally about what you and your organization are doing and sometimes in a country like Haiti with 75% unemployment, they're looking for a job and you then have a lot of people to choose from and you want to find the really good people who you can trust and we had a lot of issues with people stealing from us and really taking advantage of us, not representing the organization well to the community and to the patients. And so you want to crack down on that right away. Um, also, to, that can help you manage the logistics of operating in-country, someone who knows what they're doing. 
um, maybe not someone who has like lived in the United States forever and then they come in and they can kind of translate, but they don't know how to do the paperwork and how to deal with the local government and get things done. So that's a picture of Santo. You have a laser pointer, right? Yeah. Oh, hot. That's something. Laser point. That's Santo. This is the last. I think the last picture we took before we left, the night before we left. So that's me, 20 pounds lighter than when I arrived. Uh, Marie, our Haitian midwife, she is holding her chicken because she was very happy about having it. We had awesome food on the last night. And she's like, can I bring my chicken to the picture? Yes. Sarah, Dr. Zini, who is still down there, and our beloved Santo. So now I have the clicker. Um, working with an organization, you want to pick a good group, and that's that's really nebulous. So you have to think about different things and what you're going to want out of a group. Maybe when you get out, you're really freaked out, and you want a group that's been around for 50 years, and nothing's going to change, and you're just going to slide into a position, not have a whole lot of say in what goes on. Maybe you don't want that. Maybe you want a group that's really new, and you can have a lot of momentum and a lot of say in what's going on. There's a lot more mobility. Maybe they can just, boom, we, now we're doing gardening, and we're doing this and that. Um, so like mobility is really important too, and you want to have really solid stateside support. More than one person, you want to have them doing a lot of fundraising, handling the paperwork, handling the volunteers so that you don't have to deal with that stuff, especially when you don't have power, like we didn't have consistent power or internet. It's almost impossible to manage all that stuff in country. Um, fundraising, help them out, give them materials. We jumped right on board with Facebook and we were doing a lot of pictures writing blogs, things like that, that can help bring in money. Um, we started the Medica, Sarah, sorry, Sarah started the Medica Mamba program. We needed money quickly to, to buy some. And so we got $2,000 in about 24 hours with targeted fundraising. So help them out, but they should be doing, doing it stateside, like just at the cruise fundraiser, Mom and Baby. Good job, Kim. And Karina's not here. Um, yeah, I could talk about fundraising a lot, but basically be creative. Social media is really important. And uh, this was targeted for SCNM. You don't have NWB here, but get involved with NDI or NMSA or whatever it is you have. And that's going to really open up roads for you. Yeah. Fist bump in the back. All right, some different ways. Man, do you want to take the clicker? Keep going. All right. I'll take over in a while. I'll keep the clicker. Um, different ways to approach global health. Just an outline slide. So why naturopathic medicine? Uh, I like it because I think it's uniquely suited to global health. We can do a variety of things, kind of blend in with different cultures, use their own herbs, for instance. Um, the Haitians taught us a bit about herbs and different things that they do. We have a lot of different tools. Um, I don't know. Do you all know Dr. Sensenig? Yeah. Okay. He used to teach all the intro and all the kind of outro classes at SCNM. And I talked with him on the phone right before we left. And he said that he had been talking briefly about global health because the Institute of Naturopathic Medicine is going to have some more involvement with setting up residencies in the future. And he said he had this new like, prospective student who listened to his whole talk and then was like, I don't think naturopathic medicine is good for global health because how are they going to afford all those supplements and all the you know, crazy things you're doing? And he's like, I think you missed the whole point of my talk. <laughs> what do we do as naturopaths? It's not rhetorical. Like, throw some stuff out. Treat the cause. Right. Let the body heal. Right. Teach. Right. Obstacles to cure. So that's all kind of in the vein of just changing the environment, right? You're just kind of getting people on the path. doesn't mean you can, like, cure them right away necessarily unless you're, like, really good with homeopathy or something like that. But um, you're just changing things. Maybe the kid's got a bellyache because they drink three cups of coffee a day and they're two years old. Change the environment. Now they're better. Simple. Maybe they need more things. Maybe they need less things. Maybe they need different things. So think about it that way. Um, yeah, causes. I guess I gave you a few. I was cheating, huh? Um, if you don't know the diagnosis, which you oftentimes won't, if, like us, you didn't really have access to labs and imaging, you can kind of wing it. 
you might have it down to two diagnoses and you can kind of hedge your bets with the treatment. Maybe like homeopathy, you don't even care as much about the exact diagnosis. Um, maybe if, if any acupuncture students here? No, oh, well, there goes that one slide, okay. Um, <laughs> maybe, maybe you can use an acupuncture protocol or something that kind of balances something else. Or you do UNDAs, right? You go with Dr. Tom and his UNDA thing. Yeah, so you have different ways to treat. Um, sustain and train, so you have more sustainable medicine. We were growing food. The herbs didn't turn out so well, but I think Zine is going to try again with those. The ground's just too hot in Haiti and just fried everything. Um, train people. Santo, we are currently enrolling in a community health worker program right now. So he'll be promoted. He'll be running our own community health, following up with the ladies who gave birth and everything. Um, and then I argue that we have some unique inroads with research with the big three diseases. Specifically, I think tuberculosis could be very big in the near future, and I might get into that a little bit later. Um, you can keep going. All right, I'll keep going. Um, when I'm talking about background research, I'm talking about before you head into Haiti or Guatemala or whatever you're doing, you want to know a bit about the area um, from geography to what do people just do there, what's the culture. But be careful of culture because you're kind of putting a set of values on a bunch of people and they do not necessarily all share those values. If you read a lot about Haiti, you're going to run into voodoo and you're going to think all these people are voodoo people and I'm going to have to deal with that and whatnot. It came up twice in the over 2,000 patients that we saw. So you could spend a whole lot of time talking about that and asking about that, but as Paul Farmer showed, you don't necessarily need to change that in order for people to use your treatments and listen to your advice. Um, culture also changes all the time. So it was in the culture for the people around us to drink coffee, all the kids down to even sometimes like two months old drinking coffee full strength. And it's not anymore because we went in there and we we're like, this is just not working out for you. So, <laughs> no. What about if I just add milk to it? That's still coffee. So no, I'm <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, and then and then also don't don't think that they won't change because they have these other beliefs. People have multiple levels of different beliefs. You could be a Christian and also read research all the time. So, so could they. Um, we did a basic health survey actually before we came when we were considering taking the job and we were between mom and baby Haiti and an orphanage in the Dominican Republic. And so we did surveys on eight different villages. So we found a village leader, went in, asked them basically these things like, what do people commonly get? What do they die of? Where do women give birth? What are the typical problems in birth? All that kind of stuff, socioeconomic problems, violence against women, because you're going to tell you your approach and tell you your fundraising and how you get your initial donations based on that initial survey. So I'm really glad we did that, because otherwise we would have thought everybody's got AIDS and everybody's got TB and all this other stuff. And really, they're not as common as you would think. Statistically, they're common, but it doesn't mean that everybody has it. I'll pick up on the diseases. <laughs> the fun stuff, okay. Okay, she wants to do diseases. And the refeeding stuff. Yeah. That's her thing. All right, um, so I just added, added this slide because after we gave Grand Rounds, we were invited to um, teach Dr. Geyer's ethics class, which was really fun. We basically got up there and just had a couple different situations that we talked about. And these were basically the ones we also talked about in the United States, ethics of making money off supplements and things like that, that if you're all on that chat, you hear Dr. Morsi and Dr. Yarnell argue about that every six months or so. Um, so one situation, say you're practicing in the US and someone comes in and it's a mom and she's got three kids, she doesn't even have money to feed her kids. Are you going to see her? And if so, how are you gonna do it in your $200 an hour busy practice? So think about that. Think about ethics of discounting, does that make people not value your care, et cetera. For us, we were not charging in Haiti. And um, you'll hear a lot in the United States about people taking advantage of free clinics or if you give like, a discounts, then people devalue your care. 
On the whole, that didn't really happen with what we were doing. We did have a few moms who came in, and clearly the kid was fine, and the mom was way over-exaggerating. And when they found out that exaggerating wouldn't get you more medicine, then that died down a bit. So be aware of it, but don't let that make you turn people away. I don't think you should ever turn people away. Um, bad people, that's because I didn't want to put something really nasty on the slide. Um, Haiti, and, and really the United States, have not so good statistics on violence against women. Um, I don't even know. Probably at least half of the ladies in Haiti have had something really nasty happen to them. There are guys doing that, and they're walking into your clinic for care. So think about that when you get into practice. You're probably going to treat some people who have done some bad things. Maybe they've been convicted, like a convicted rapist or something. Uh, maybe they haven't. You might not even know it. And you are going to have to decide what your comfort levels are for what you are willing to treat versus refer out. Another way to think of it is that maybe this person just has so much pain in their life that maybe you're the one thing that's going to turn them around or get them to stop beating their kids or something like that. So it's not so nice to think about, but you need to think ahead because it might happen where you're in the room your doctor all on your own and this situation comes up and you're going to want to keep a good poker face and be professional about it. So think about it. Um, also, when and where to refer. When you are a new doctor, you are going to have a certain comfort zone and it's going to be much smaller than when you're more experienced. But you have to get more experience somehow. So. Think about how much you want to be kind of spreading your wings and getting more difficult cases that might challenge you and teach you versus, you know, they would really be best served by someone else because it is ultimately about the patient and not about you getting brownie points and, oh, look, I did this without medications kind of thing. So watch your ego. Vaccinations, um, like Sarah said, think about them for yourself. Uh, I chose to get typhoid and hepatitis A because I wouldn't want to get either of those. And there was a decent risk that I could contract those in Haiti. And now I'm down. Sarah's the only doc. She's got to treat me and all these other people. You know, I, I had my travel vaccinations and I didn't get sick at all. So don't think that vaccinations are always going to damage you. In turn, there's a different debate on vaccinations in the United States where most of those things have already been cleared out or, and are pretty low priority or maybe just not that risky like, say, chicken pox. It's different in a developing country. We saw a lot of measles come in, a lot of mumps come in, and it's hard to know how much maybe damage could have been averted. You could argue that vaccinations in the United States actually followed improvements in public health, so maybe we didn't need them so much. There's very little public health in Haiti. Cholera, we just got the latest report, has killed 5,000 and hospitalized 300,000? Oh, yeah. So that's three and a half, three point, three hundred fifty thousand, basically. Like that, yeah. that's it's crazy. Terrible. There is no public health, so. And it's treatable. I mean, think about that. We just need oral rehydration solutions. It's so treatable, and people are dying. It's awful. Because they're drinking dirty water and shaking hands. So, um, think about that too. Advising your patients in that different country, you might have a totally different take on vaccinations, and don't feel bad about that. Um, and then abortion. Some of you probably have very strong stances one way or the other on abortion. And think about how you might refer or give information or not or something like that. So it's all ethics. This is red now. Does that matter? It's locked. Okay. Yeah, it's working. Looks cool, though. Um, considerations with your clinic. Think about the location. Be as specific as possible, region, country, state, city, wherever. Um, I know that um, Jennifer's husband, Fernando, found our clinic, and it's beautiful. It's really great. The building wasn't done when we got there, and so we had to put a lot of money and months of effort into improving it and whatnot. But if we had started from the ground up, it would have just taken forever and it might have been cheaper, more expensive. There's different things to think about with your comfort level, how much you want to spend doing construction versus, you know, joining partners in health and just working in their place. 
Um, opportunities for social entrepreneurship. So it's not so much with um, your clinic, but more how you fund your clinic, like Sarah talked about, getting a tap tap or a moto taxi business, or maybe you do it like Dr. Laura in, at Marte Hare, which I think you had said you had seen, so maybe some of you have seen that website. They have an eco resort on a beach in Chicala, Mexico, and that money from travelers is then funneled into the clinic, into a free clinic. So think about stuff like that. That would make your funding a lot easier. Um, I'll talk about malnutrition. Sure. Um, so w the biggest problem we saw in Haiti was malnutrition, hands down. Even if people were getting enough maybe calories in their diet, they were still mal malnourished for the most part. Protein was really expensive. Even beans were sometimes too expensive. We often saw women with maybe five or six or seven kids, and maybe her guy had run off, and she couldn't work and was trying to take care of them, and maybe they would all eat you know, a cup of white rice a day. And So anyway, we realized that we really needed to focus on malnutrition, because that seemed to be the root cause of many of the problems, as you all know. If you're, not, if, you know, if you're taking in junk or not enough, then there are many problems that will result. So we started a garden. Um, Kim Koble in our audience was one of the first ladies to help us start the garden. Uh, we planted a lot of vegetables, a lot of herbs. The herbs didn't really take off. Everything I put in the ground did not grow, so that was a good lesson to me. <laughs> um, but what we ended up doing was we got some white rice from an organization called Food for the Poor, and if we realized that a family was truly in need, we would give them a couple bags of rice just to help a little bit. And we instructed them, if at all possible, to invest in things like beans and chicken and fish and other high-protein sources. And then we would give them vegetables from our garden. Um, and the plan is eventually in Haiti to get to bring people into our yard as an example of, what, of how sustainable you can be, of how to grow the plants. We, were, we had them in different stages, you know, seedlings to fully grown. And then we would give people seeds and the tools to do what they needed to do in their own yard. One of the biggest challenges with that is the lack of water. People have to walk many miles to get water. If they have to do that, are they going to want to put it on their plants if they need to also drink it and also wash their clothes in it and bathe in it and cook it, cook with it, all of those things? And so that's a big hurdle that needs to be overcome. But it's still one step in the right direction. Um, another wonderful thing that we discovered, what's that noise? OK. I wasn't sure if like a jet was landing on us or something. Um, <laughs> So another wonderful program we found um, is called Medica Mamba, and it's a fortified peanut butter that has vitamins, milk um, for extra protein, oil, and it's, it's balanced to take a starving child to a nourished state in 8 to 12 weeks or less. It's also being used in AIDS patients in the Port-au-Prince area. And it's created by a group called Meds and Food for Kids. It's medsandfoodforkids.org. They have some really moving pictures if you want to check it out. Um, this was an area that I just really felt called to really participate in. I would often go to bed crying at night because how can you look a mother in the face when you don't have any food that you can give her and say, well, you just need to try to feed your kids more when you know she can't. I mean, that's how can I say that coming from my privileged lifestyle? So this was a way that we could really make a difference and really help. Um, if a child was d determined to have either marasmus or kwashiorkor, which we'll talk about in a minute, they would be admitted into the program, and then they would be given these little sachets with the peanut butter, and they would give, we would give them a certain amount each day to eat, and then if they were still hungry, they could eat other food on top of that if it was available. But it made a huge difference. Um, one of the most profound things that I saw was a little, she was either seven or eight months old when we first saw her. Her mom had run off, and so grandma was trying to take care of her, couldn't really afford formula. So she was eating this flour mixed with milk and sugar. And I mean, think about that. That's not only inflammatory, but it doesn't have any nutrients in it. And so that's what she was surviving on. Um, she had lost the ability to hold her head up. And I wasn't sure if it was a cerebral palsy thing or just serious malnutrition. But after a week of being on formula and Medica Mamba, she started to get a little bit of strength back and could start to hold her head up. And she was also gaining weight. So she was on the road to recovery. Um, it's just amazing what good food can do. So what else was I going to talk about? Oh, yeah, formula is not evil. I know as naturopaths, it's ideal to breastfeed. It really, really is. We all know that. It's amazing what breast milk can do. But when you have a mom who is maybe killed in the earthquake or, you know, the baby doesn't have any other option, formula is great. It's, it's the only thing. And when you can't refrigerate breast milk from a, from a donor, 
that's really all you can do. It can make a difference. So it's, I think sometimes as naturopaths we become really dogmatic and we get really ingrained in our thoughts and our beliefs. And that's important and that's great, but it's also important to step outside of the box and realize that sometimes you, know, you just need to do what's best for the patient. So. Yeah. Right. And you may know about Plumpy Nut, which is the, the French version, basically, and came before Medica Mamba. And they're actually merging. Um, Meds and Foods for Kids is actually going to be making Medica Mamba Plumpy Nut, which is going to have both things, which is really cool. Oh, and the great thing about this program, uh, the Medica Mamba program, is that it's made in Haiti with Haitian peanuts. Haitian farmers are putting the work into it. The factory is in Haiti in the Cap Haitian area. And it's, it's great because it's totally sustainable. So good stuff. Yeah. And what, um, what the lady the founder told us was that all Haitian peanuts that are not grown for Medica Mamba under their standards are um, contaminated with aflatoxin. So all that Haitian peanut butter we've been eating, not so good. Like liver cancer in 30 years. Diarrhea, it's, it's no good. So Everything causes diarrhea in Haiti. <laughs> everything. Yeah, everything does. <laughs> everything. That's where Santo got that. All right. So here's a picture of um, NWB Bastier Marketing VP Patrick Fox with Dr. Xenia and one of the kids from the orphanage, and they are planting. And we put up this, uh, the bamboo stakes and the chicken wire fence. And uh, I don't know, was that while you were there? Yep, so yeah, while Kelly was there, Kelly the midwife. And we actually sent all three weeks of students that, that came in in March and April and we had a really booming garden by the end of it. And they actually had a water well, so that made that very easy. They had good dirt. We just had to clean it out. There were like knives and batteries and all kinds of junk in Shoes. the dirt. Shoes. Shoes. Rabbit dogs. Sweaters that you had to like dig out. It's no good. Next. There we go. Um, one really neat thing that I had no idea existed was called a shade house. And Kim and I had been talking with Joe Perkins from this organization called, oh no, Sustainable Sustainable Food Production that's yeah. under this church group that he's on the board for. And Joe's been for decades going to different countries and setting up these shade houses. So he wired us $500 to get all the PVC pipe. And then these are cinder block. I don't know, you probably can't see those, cinder blocks and some rebar to build the structure, and then they brought the shade. And the idea is that many uh, food crops are gonna grow better if the soil's not so friggin' hot. It's like 125 degrees that he measured. With the shade house, it was closer to 100 degrees. So things grew a lot better. You could start more things there and then move them out when they're more hardy and grown up. And uh, yeah, they were, they were great. They took care of everything. They taught us a lot about gardening. I didn't know about short day onions versus long day onions and stuff like that. So we learned a lot from them. Um, community education is really important. You're going to do it on an individual basis all the time. That's your dossier. But you want to do it on a grander scale because you don't want to spend five minutes every time talking about not drinking coffee with every kid who walks in. So do it on a grander scale. It makes your job a lot easier. You can start seeing more than just belly aches caused by coffee, for instance. You can get some more difficult things where you need some more of your skill. Quick pearl is that you could do it in the waiting room because you have a captive audience. We had first come, first serve, and we'd give them numbers. So there might be 100 patients out, not not yet patients, out wanting to be patients. And then we might only see 30 to 35 in a day for kids. And once they're in the waiting room, before you start your clinic, you could have your translator just give a little talk on nutrition or on family planning or whatever it is, or breastfeeding, whatever it is that you're, that you're seeing, that you're seeing in your, in your area. Um, problem with nutritional recommendations is sometimes when you're looking for the obstacle to cure, whoever said that, um, and maybe it's coffee, but they just heard you shouldn't drink coffee if you're a kid. So then mom comes in, belly aches. Are they drinking coffee? No. 
No, because I just heard I I'm not supposed gonna... to. So I'm not going to tell you I yeah. am because it's wrong. Yeah. I right. mean, you're not going to yell at your patients or anything like that. But they're immediately wanting that approval. So that might make it harder. So you might not, ironically, not talk about nutrition a whole lot if you're relying on kind of diet recall in your differentials and in your treatment. Um, you also want to know about the availability of foods in the area. Um, we had a student come down to Rocky Point and tell people to eat organic <laughs> in Mexico, like starving people. Like, that's not the focus of your nutritional intervention. And in Haiti, they actually they don't use pesticides, so that's irrelevant anyway, and they don't know what you're talking about. Um, more basic things. You want to know what kinds of beans and peas are around. Um, if they have milk, you want to know what kind of milk. If you're telling a kid to get off of milk for allergies or something like that, um, they might get off liquid milk, but not understand that's different from powdered milk. So you're like, man, I thought dairy avoidance would have been the key, and the kid didn't get better. Um, it's because they were drinking powdered milk. I had that once. Um, I recommend, as we are now doing with Mom Baby, hiring a community health worker Someone who can follow up with patients who need continuing care. The classic example is tuberculosis. They're going to need, depending on the type of tuberculosis, like six to 18 months of care, daily doses. If they don't take it, it's not just a, oh, they were non-compliant. Now you have a resistant strain, and they're still coughing it up. You have a public health nightmare. So someone who can follow up. Um, Native speaker, ideally, someone who really knows the social norms, who can go house to house, who has some training, maybe, and can help triage in your clinic. When we had some volunteers come uh, on one of the village clinics, we had a triage station, the doctor station, and then a medicinary. And we saw three times as many patients that way. Because instead of us having to write down their name, write down the chief complaints and durations, do the medical part, examine all that, and then have it to fill the bottles or the bags or however you're distributing your things or giving your treatments. That takes a lot of time doing that extraneous stuff. And there's actually a really good model for doing this right. Um, Global Medical Brigades operates in Honduras. I think it's medicalbrigades.com. Um, I've been involved with um, one of their students who's now in the water version of it called Water Global Water Brigades. And they have actually a map that you can look at and you could base your clinic off of it for an intake doctor section pharmacy. And it, it's pretty slick and we started kind of modeling after them. Um, also, delegating really easy things lets you do more difficult things. So if you're sending out a health worker to do like a mini clinic in a village and they're just treating like colds and flus and they send you the more difficult cases so you can see more people and it's more interesting than treating colds and flus and stiffly noses all the time. Uh, collaboration. Working with infrastructure, there's a question mark there because on the one hand you do not want to create a parallel system of care where you are, you know, you go to Haiti and Haiti has its hospital system and it's kind of, you know, ancillary clinics. And now there's mom and baby, and they're not talking to each other. You don't want a parallel system where you're kind of reinventing the wheel. You want to be integrating with them. The exception with this is if there's a lot of corruption. Um, then, it, I mean, oddly enough, this is not what I'd really recommend, but staying a little under the radar would be more wise if there's kind of a risk there. Um, that's going to be more in a place with civil war or something like that, which is probably not a good first place to go, like the Congo, for instance. You probably don't want to start off there. Um, I also want to add, um, this was a big problem, especially in Haiti. There are 10,000 aid groups in Haiti on the ground right now. It's more per capita than anywhere in the world. And they're putting doctors out of business in Haiti, which is really sad. I mean, yes, the people need care. Yes, most of the doctors aren't in medical care to give good care. They're in it to make money. However, we also need to be respectful of that culture and that community and what those doctors are trying to do. So it's, it, those are important considerations because you don't want the patients to be without care, but you know, how can we giving free care put someone out of business? It's, it's kind of a hard line to, to walk.
to walk. So consider that wherever you go. And that also plays into your community assessment. We went where there weren't any other doctors in the area, and we knew that people were not going to get medical care, and the hospital is 45 minutes away. And that's assuming that people have money to get into the hospital, that they can bring sheets and, and buy medications there. It's not a guarantee that they'll get care. A Cuban doctor popped up after us, but I don't think we were really affecting his business. And we referred to him, so I don't know if it was. You never know. We never met him, but yeah. people invited us in. So, um, yeah, work with other NGOs in the area. You might find some water people, for instance, or some gardening people. So instead of having to do it yourself, you just call them up and hook up with them. They're probably better at it than you are, and you're probably better at the medical part than they are. So. Um, there is a network, for instance, um, there's a network in the Capation area that coordinates a lot of those local health-based NGOs called the Cap Health Network. I've sent a couple of their reports out to the NGA MN listserv. Um, St. Francois Hospital was right next to us. If you heard about our story leaving during the riots, that was the priest that helped us out. So networking is very important, especially in sticky situations. And there's actually an NGO based in Portland, Maine, whose goal is to support the, the public health infrastructure. And so they have an office in the Maine hospital in CAP. They do supply chain logistics. They train community health workers for the hospital. So you might even do that and just say, instead of making my own clinic, I'm actually going to directly integrate and aid other organizations. Let's talk about some more fun stuff now. That was all like organizational, blah, blah, blah. Treatments. Uh, vitamin A is going to be one of your most versatile um, tools. It, um, there's a really fascinating story on the discovery of vitamin A preventing night blindness in uh, a documentary called Rx for Survival, which was on PBS in like 2004, and Brad Pitt narrated it, and it was really popular. Um, they talked about the story of Alfred Sommer, the ophthalmologist who discovered this little tidbit. Um, in going to Nepal, he did some studies on vitamin A supplementation and found that it decreases all-cause mortality. Um, helps a lot with measles, conventionally also um, acute diarrhea and blindness prevention. This is medical literature. Everybody knows this stuff. This is more our stuff. Anytime you've got an immune thing, eye thing, skin thing, vitamin A is going to be really helpful. Careful if you're dosing. Um, this is standard World Health Organization dosing. There are programs in 170 different countries for giving this every six months. So again, parallel system, make sure that you're plugging in, asking when their last vitamin A dose was, which they tend to give with vaccination campaigns. Um, when do you not want to give a bunch of vitamin A? Pregnancy, okay. gotta make sure. You give a little bit, like, depends on the source, but up to about 10,000 a day is fine, 5,000 a day is fine. Um, but you, if you get a pregnant lady who's sick, you might use something else like vitamin C, for instance. And they, uh, if you hook up with the right supplier, you can get these 200,000 IU caps, which are really, really nice. It's that big, it's red. You cut the top, put the drops in, done. Barring that, um, there's a company, I don't know, do you all order from like Emerson or Natural Partners where you get your goods? Um, professional Complementary Health Formulas has a 25,000 emulsified drop thing. It's like comes in a two ounce bottle, I think. That's really inexpensive too. And easier than the capsules actually. Um, Probiotics are really useful for preventing diarrhea and other things. They help boost your immune system. They don't even need to be alive to be boosting your immune system. That is amazing. Um, constipation also. Um, any kind of inflammatory thing, perhaps boosting mood. There's been a lot in the news lately about different biotypes in your gut and how that could affect your risk for diabetes or depression or anxiety based on what basically the bacteria pooping into your poop. It's pretty amazing stuff. Think about local fermented foods. Uh, in Haiti, that would be beer. I didn't find anything else. In some places, you know, like maybe kefir or yogurt or sauerkraut or ginger or something like that. 
I didn't find anything like that in Haiti, and we asked. So you might have to bring them in. We had a really generous donation from Brandy Gowie of Naturopaths International. She gave us an army rucksack full of Saccharomyces boulardii, which is a really fast proliferating um, probiotic. It's a yeast, actually, but it kills candida. Don't worry about that. We used it a lot for vaginal infections, any kind of gut thing going on, anytime you need an immune boost. Um, starter, kefir starter packets. We actually did this once in Mexico, and then we left, so it didn't, it didn't keep going. But um, you could buy these little starter packets at, I don't know if you have like Whole Foods or whatever here. I'm not from around here, so. Um, boil some milk, let it go to room temperature, put the starter in there, let it sit for 24 hours, and now you have this kind of weird, like fizzy yogurt thing. You could take a chunk of that and do it again, because it's all bacteria, right? All bacteria and yeasts. So I have this grand idea for like a research project that I might not ever get to do where you would do that in a community to inoculate people because probiotics reduce your risk of traveler's diarrhea by about 50%, 33 to 50%, depending on the study you read. So if you prevented people from getting sick, then you prevent them from pooping dangerous things into the water, and you're still preventing them from getting sick and pooping, and maybe you could, kind of like a vaccination through herd immunity, reduce the pathogen load in a community. I don't know if any public health people, research people, go for it. Don't have to give me too much credit for it. Uh, all right, this was a formula that I put together. This is a shotgun approach to killing skin infections. Um, you could make it a variety of different ways. This is just, I took every antimicrobial thing we had and put it together and stuck it on kids' heads because we needed to kill this fungus, um, especially the especially the, the tinnias. But it had some success in controlling impetigo, not so much in a lot of other things, but um, I liked it. Tell them it why it's named what it is. Ringworms, like ringworm herbs. Yeah. <laughs> well, first it was <laughs> worms because we needed a worm formula. We didn't have albendazole or mebendazole, which you should get. Don't be afraid of meds. We'll get more into that later. Um, and then we're like, well, we need a formula for these tinnias, and that's a ringworm, so ringworms, pretty slick. Um, you could do it in a bigger bottle, but we had a really good donation from um, Dr. Jesse Black, who talked with Patricia here, was that like a month ago, two months ago? Um, she gave us like hundreds of these bottles, so we used them all up. It took a while to get through them, but they're really useful. Oh. Oh, this is the fun part. Do any of you have an activator or a knockoff activator? Do you know what that is? I didn't bring it with me. I didn't bring my props. It's probably in our car. Yeah, everything we own is in like five bags in our car right now, in our rental car, because we just moved We've been lugging them around Haiti. for two weeks. <laughs> yeah, we packed up and moved. So um, it's a clicker. Basically, it's like this long, and... Yes. You hold it in your hand, and you twist a ring that determines how much thrust it delivers. This is for this is instrument-assisted manipulation. So instead of using your hands, maybe you've got a kid. You don't want to do a manual manipulation. Or someone with osteoporosis or really questionable you know, ligament integrity or something like that. But you still want to give them the benefits of an adjustment. You can buy an activator. I think they're up to five different activators. And there's an air activator. There's the impulse adjusting tool. The... I don't know, there's some torque one. I don't know. Uh, I went on eBay, and you can get a JTEC medical cat, sorry, chiropractic adjusting tool for like 150 bucks, and it works just the same. Um, here's what we're going to do. This is the hands-on part. Turn to the person next to you, which might be difficult if you're all alone in the front because <laughs> you're the best student, right? Um, just like... Pair up. One of you stand up and go behind the other one in a non-creepy way. <laughs> SNM liked this one, so we kept it in the speech. So, one sits down facing me. Other one stands up facing me. Nat, you're just gonna have to wing it. Sorry. All right. Quick concept is mirror image adjusting. You probably do this and you don't realize it, right? If you've got a lesion that's kind of stuck left, you're gonna 
pop it the other way, right? It's the same exact thing. Do you all remember from, uh, maybe I didn't like neurology? Proprioceptors. What are proprioceptors? Right, position sense. If you hit those, you will move things without physically moving them. You'll change where the brain thinks they are. So if you are, say, rotated slightly to the left, it's usually C2, right? That's more of your rotation, like 50 to 80%. So say you're slightly rotated left, so a person sitting down goes slightly to your left. Say that, that's your lesion, right? A left, a left posterior C2. Turn them to the right like that. Person standing up like, shh, creepy. 70% of your proprioceptors are right under your occiput. So all you're going to do, you're going to make like you have a gun because that's as close as you can get without having activated. You're going to shoot them right in the skull, like right in the suboccipital. It's not creepy, not creepy. You're just going to, you can even make the click sound if you want. But you're going to do it on both sides. That's fine. You can, you can yeah. flick them. Just so you get the Don't idea. cause pain. You don't have to really have a gun. Proprioceptors inhibit mechanoreceptors, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. That's all you're going to do. Seriously, you're going to rotate them away. Click, 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 click. Switch people. Because we're pretending because we don't have activators. So. We're not rolling in the dough. We can give you all activators. Switch people. Hands on. Hands on. All right. Now that you've been rotated to the right, you're going to make the other person rotate the other way. So, you know, because now you've been clicked the wrong way. So, so put him the other way. And again, just feel right under the occiput. Click, click. Click, click the other side. I just had a, I was thinking about doing this with the speech, and I had a, and I had a patient who came in, headache with the. Uh, you could all sit down now if you're all. You got the idea. Of, bam. Uh, I, I actually had a had a patient who came in, new headache, seemed to just be kind of a structural tension headache, no neuro signs or anything like that not dehydrated like the other 80% of headaches that we were seeing in, ha in Haiti. So I just had him do a basic, you know, standing postural thing, close your eyes, move your head around, and he was clearly rotated. I will say it was to the right because I can't remember. And so I laid him down, felt him, confirmed what I thought based on the postural analysis, flipped him left, pop, 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 pop. And he's a little closer now, and his headache's a little better. I did it, I think, three rounds. And then he was straight lined up, and his headache's gone. It's like two minutes. Super easy. You, you can get really fancy, but I know a lot of NDs, um, based on Dr. Nick's survey, end up not doing much physical medicine because they don't feel competent. They didn't get enough practice in school, or they're worried they're going to hurt someone. Hard to hurt someone with an activator, I'll tell you. I mean, unless you like turn it all the way up and hit them right in the head. That, that hurts, <laughs> but don't do that. Um, so that's, that's basically mirror image adjusting. If you want more information on this, chiropractic biophysics is a chiropractic technique that teaches this. And Petty Bond also teaches this. Put this down, I was getting too excited. Okay. Um, this is a slide that I could delete because I now realize there are no acupuncturists here. But maybe you learned some. Oh, okay. But maybe eventually you'll get one of these. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay, cool. All right. Well, this website is really cool because you can buy acupuncture supplies, including needles. You're supposed to have a license, but if you put student, they don't ask you for a license. So when we had to get our acupuncture kits in, at SNM because we have to learn acupuncture, everyone just ordered off this website because... I mean, you actually don't need anything. That's kind of scary. But you could buy one of these piezo stimulators if you don't want to use needles for some reason. Again, like doing your background research, maybe you don't have a um, medical waste program in the country that can handle sharps. Maybe you don't want to be bringing waste into the country, um, needles or whatever. You can use this stimulator just like you would with needles. Just, again, pop it a couple times on the points you want. Think about that. There's a... Uh, I was originally going to be a chiropractor, so I used to read a lot of the dynamic chiropractic thing, and there's uh, 
There's a guy that writes about acupuncture all the time, John Amaro, and he talks about these. And he's got some cool protocols. So anyway, um, think about Sharps containers and stuff like that, too. Sure. All right. Um, let me have a click. Ah, thanks. So I was not a homeo nerd in school, um, but I love homeopathy now. And there are many ways to do it. And it's great in a resource-poor setting, because how much does a remedy cost? Not a lot, right? And what we did is we, would, we bought a kit. What's the name of the company? Um, it's A to A, and then the number 2, Z, homeopathy.com. It's Natural Health Supply. He remembers everything. So it's like an encyclopedia at my side of every day. Um, we bought a few kits in different potencies. We bought like a 30C, a 200C, and a 1M. And then we had 300 remedies, well, 100 in each kit at three different potencies. And instead of giving everyone the pellets as we normally do, we did water dilutions. And then we could give, they went even further. So we were able to, well, what, what does one of the kits cost? Like 150 bucks for 100 remedies? Yeah, a little more. So, I mean, that's really cheap. Um, anyway, we were taught by Dr. Stephen Messer at SCNM. Uh, I don't know if any of you have heard of him, but... He's a homeopathy god, and he made these flow charts. Um, we can get those to you through Nat if you'd like, but they're very, very useful as, as far as... Do you have copies of those, by chance? Did they give those to you at school? We can give them to you. Yeah, I'll throw them on the flash drive. No problem, I yeah. to put them on there. Um, but they're really great because they tell you, okay, did the patient react? Yes or no? And then you, you, know, you just go through the flow chart, and it really helps you to know if you should be redosing the remedy, if you need to wait, if you need to go up to a higher potency, if you need to retake the case... It's really helpful. Um, do study homeopathy, even if it's not your thing, if you're going to do global health, because sometimes they come in and you don't have the med that you need. You don't have the supplement that you need. They can't afford the food that you want. You could always give them homeopathy and at least help a little bit. Um, here are some, some of the most common remedies that we saw. Green, thick, sticky, ropey mucus. It, if it sticks between your fingers like this, think calibacromicum. Profuse, yellow, watery, painless, gushing diarrhea with undigested food. Saw that a lot. That's actually pretty much what Giardia looks like. Podophyllum. Um, the Hail Mary seizure. What do you mean by that? Seizures and you don't really know how to rep it. Oh, okay. Shotgun sure approach. Doing this. Heathen, heathen homeopathy. Uh, I think Cuprum. We, it works. Seizures are really hard to treat, as you probably all know. And Sean had a couple of really successful cases giving cuprum kind of off the cuff. Really reduced the frequency and the severity of the seizures. So it's a good remedy if you're not sure what else to do if you ever see seizures. Seizures. Super sad sense. Um, we had a lot of patients that started coming in that hadn't really processed their feelings from the earthquake. And so maybe, you know, it was about a year and a half later. And... They hadn't really talked to anyone, and as a culture, they just sort of pull themselves up by their bootstraps and move on and don't really talk about it. So we gave a lot of Ignatia and Natmer to help process feelings. Projectile vomiting. Our very first day as licensed doctors, we were in a hospital in Capetian, scared out of our minds. Um, we had a couple cholera patients, a probable tuberculosis patient, a guy with the most severe headache of his life that was maybe either meningitis or something else. And I was like, where are my rashes and my stuffy noses and my headaches? And I didn't know what I was doing. But um, anyway, this, this patient, Sean walked in the door, because I had been there earlier than he was, and this patient just vomited on the floor, just projectile vomited. And he's like, Ipecac. And this patient was kind of on his deathbed. He wasn't really responsive. His eyes were kind of rolled back in his head. He couldn't you know, sit up by himself. We had some IVs going, and as soon as he had the Ipecac, his eyes started to brighten a little bit, and he ended up walking out that day under his own power. So it can be very powerful. Um, if you're hacking up a lung but can't get deep, sorry, can't get deep enough to get the gunk up, think Causticum. Um, it's also a good UTI remedy. And acute trauma, think Arnica. Everyone knows that one. Um, communication is really important with the outside world. It's important to make sure that you are not only able to communicate if there is an emergency, but also that you can communicate with friends and family. It can be very isolating. And so in Haiti, the power could go on for 20 minutes and then off for three days, or then you know on for five minutes, off for an hour, on for 20 minutes, off for you know, whatever. And it can be very difficult to get things done and to communicate. So 
we ended up investing in a battery backup system that at least allowed us to have about an hour of internet with no power. So if anything went wrong and we needed to email, we at least had that. We also had Haitian cell phones, and then as a backup, Sean kept his US cell phone so that we could put that SIM card in if we needed to, to call out. Um, here are just some options for different companies in Haiti. Consider solar panels um, and solar power. It's not only green and economical, but it's wonderful when the power in your, in your country is very unreliable. Um, we didn't realize this, but the Amazon Kindle, if you get the 3G version, gives you free internet pretty much anywhere that there are phone lines, straight up free. You do not have to pay a monthly fee. It's amazing. It's kind of archaic, but instead of paying a monthly thing for an iPad, which we are considering doing, it's free. And it worked in Haiti. I could be on the roof, and there would be no power, and I could be emailing people you know, wherever I wanted to be. So it's pretty great. And there's a coverage map on, the, on Amazon's website. We have no I'll affiliation with Amazon, by the way. They should be giving us a lot of money, but they yeah. don't. So. <laughs> um, Google Groups are a great way to, if you have ideas um, that you need everyone to hear about, just create a Google Group, and then everyone can get the emails. You don't have to email 25 people every time you want to send something out. Um, okay, diseases, fun stuff. We made you wait till the end to talk about diseases. Belly cakes. We had a translator that kept saying belly cakes instead of belly aches, and we were not going to correct him for anything. And then someone finally corrected him, so he started saying belly aches, but it was adorable. Um, <laughs> so belly aches, other than malnutrition, I think belly aches were probably the second most common thing that we saw. I mean, everyone had them. It was, And just determining the cause was a huge learning curve for us, because in the US, you think, you know, you have your basics, like maybe it's GERD, maybe it's constipation, maybe they have diarrhea for whatever reason. And yeah, we saw those, but often it was just hunger. And it was really, you know, really sad to see a five-year-old kid come in and they have a bellyache every morning. And then we would decide, or we would talk to them, well, when do you eat your last meal of the day? 2 p.m. And when, when do you get your bellyache? First thing in the morning. Well, of course they're going to be hungry. They can't go that long without eating. And so it was often just a lot of educating about that. Coffee, Sean talked about that. Every child was drinking coffee. <laughs> and then we cut it out, and their bellyache went away. Uh, inflammation and dysbiosis from horrible food. That's a lot of rice and beans, a lot of wheat, coffee, milk, a lot of inflammatory things. MSG, they use these bullion cubes that have MSG in them to cook a lot. So just a lot of inflammation. Worms, um, if you're working in a <laughs> With peds especially, watch your floor because many things will fall on your floor during your visit. I think Sean got most of that. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, <laughs> I got all the vomiting and kids, not like every vomiting case, but the kids that vomited in our office. Um, one, one kid, I was, he was really suspicious for worms. He had a really big distended abdomen. It was really hard, like a drum. He, which had been getting distended the last couple days. Um, he hadn't been treated for worms, didn't see him in his poop, which we'll kind of get to how to work through worms, but um, he just had pain, but didn't have vomiting or anything. And you want to ask about vomiting, well, we'll get there too. So I went to, to just do a basic exam, and as soon as I went up to touch his abdomen, boom, just spaghettios on the floor. and. So that's, that's why I was saying, watch your floor. And also, don't wash your dishes on the floor. Because we had our dishwasher guy started doing that, and everybody got sick, except for me and Edie. He's a robot, I swear. He doesn't get sick. <laughs> he remembers everything. Of a complex. <laughs> um, yeah, so you know how to treat things. I mean, just remove the junk and put in good things. I mean, that's really easy, right? So probiotics, demulsins, carminatives, bitters, all of those lovely things. Herbs are really, really, really great for treating GI things, as you know. Also ginger tea, B6, protein, NUX and CPF for morning sickness. Um, it was great for all the pregnant women that were suffering from that. Homeopathy, if they're better pressing deep, if they really, really want pressure, colosynthes. Um, if they're gassy, better passing gas, Favon and Creole, like a podium. If they're better with burping, consider carbo-veg. And the, obviously, you need to take a case, but if you're running out of time or something and you just need a quick 
off-the-cuff remedy. These are just things to consider. Yeah, big keynotes. Um, we actually had three separate ladies who had this back pain. Oh, yeah. Um, Tell them about that. Back pain. And they, older people talk about pain as gas, which you'll, you'll read about in, in the crash course. And it's because they mean the pain is kind of distending or pressure, like gas pain. But they'll say, like, I have gas in my shoulder or in my head or wherever. And you're like, really? <laughs> um, oddly, like, like a podium works oftentimes with that, even though you wouldn't think it would. Um, we had three ladies who came in and they're like, I have this back pain and when I touch it, I start burping and then I feel better. Really, like, Seriously. you as a person feel better or your back pain gets better, my back pain gets better. Like carbo veg, I, I don't know. I, it's not in the repertory in synthesis or Kent, so. Um, one of, I ended up doing two acupuncture treatments and her back pain went away for well, we saw her like months later and was still better. But and one woman was laying there burping the entire time the acupuncture session was going on. It was so funny. It was just yeah, like, like why does this happen, you know? Rebellious stomach G, but I don't yeah. know how that would accu you students, I don't know. Um, other thing <laughs> that I, I quiz students on at SCM. and um, what do carminatives do? As a general simple as you can make it, what do carminatives do? How do they do that? <laughs> Make you burp or fart? Not quite. They, they basically just calm down digestion. It's like if something is just aggravated, really gassy, you just want to kind of break that up. Carminatives, calming things, think like fennel and fenugreek and all that. Um, what do bitters do? Opposite, they increase it. So think about that, what's going on in the abdomen, and do you want to turn it up or turn it down? Really easy for picking herbs. Ginger does both. So um, Haitians would drink ginger tea sometimes. There's easily available ginger root. So I'd give a lot of ginger tea. And um, sometimes we'd use carminatives and bitters, but we tend to just kind of give them probiotics and, again, get rid of the bad stuff, add some good stuff, and usually their bellies would get better. So. Water is also really great for everything. And we found that a lot of people were drinking maybe one glass of water a day, maybe two. And just think about that, how dehydrated you can get over time and in the hot sun and outside working, walking everywhere you go. Water just made a big difference, even a small increase. So, I think about how hard it might be for them to get more water, too, if they have to walk a mile to a pump right. or get it from a dirty stream. Think about that. Yeah, you want to make sure it's clean water. Diarrhea and vomiting, get the juicy details. Sean wrote that. <laughs> okay, I can't remember what to give for profuse, painless, watery diarrhea and projectile vomiting. Okay, so first the profuse, painless, watery diarrhea, what would you give? We just talked about it. Are you paying attention? <laughs> Anybody? The remedy. Yeah, good. Yes. Potophyllum, very good. And how about projectile vomiting? Yes, very Ipecac. good. Has anyone seen those Ipecac videos on YouTube? Uh, you'll never forget. If you're studying for boards, <laughs> you'll never, ever forget Ipecac if you watch those. Google it. There's even like a family guy on it that you won't forget it. And that guy looked like that. So I got it in about half a second. Yes. All those gross um, videos I watched helped me out. Again, you want to give probiotics, bug killers, vitamin A and zinc. Uh, and then the bigger picture, yeah, it, sure, it's great to treat people for their individual diarrhea and vomiting, but why not reduce it community-wide? So if you can get the funding to build latrines, get wells, get purified water. Um, we had a really cool donation, actually, in Haiti that, I don't know, who donated it? Patricia, do you know that the water filtration system? water thing that Sato It came from up? Hinch. I, um, the big one that you guys have in your Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It was so cool. It, um, I didn't really know what it was for at first, and then it would pull the moisture out of the air and make clean water from it. So you didn't have to buy water. It just would, and so it reduced the humidity in the house, and it was a perfect setting because Haiti is super humid. So it was really cool. Um, thank you. Yes, so that's that what it is. Air yes. to water. How much did it, for, how long did it take to 
About six hours. Six hours a month. A lot. I don't know how much it held, but a lot. We never, it never ran out. I think if you ran it overnight, it would give you like three liters. Yeah. It took a little while the first time you started up, and then you have to dump out that first water because the filter's new. I didn't know that, and I took a drink, and I was like, this is awful. <laughs> so terrible. And the other cool thing about that is you can also just plug in household water if you have water flowing, and it'll filter that too. And then you don't have to run the condensing thing all the time. So it has two little attachments. So I think they should move it but to the kitchen. But you have to have power. Case. Yeah. I think so. I'm pr the one we had anyway. Maybe they have others that run off of something else. But yeah, yeah. you need electricity. to. It's basically yeah. like running uh, like a refrigerator, but it just condenses instead of cooling. Yeah. Pretty slick. Um, also important to consider distribution of chlorine tablets and bleach drops. Um, you can give just a little bit of bleach in a big thing of water, and that can keep a family from getting diarrhea. Okay, 26, I mean, tw why, why did you put that? I don't know. When, oh. when did it happen? Oh, yeah, okay. Now I get it. That's 27 year old female presents with sudden onset profuse diarrhea that's tan colored, water, rotary painless, with severe urging. She's becoming delusional, has calf pain. Then the profuse vomiting sets in. She doesn't know if she should vomit or have diarrhea. So any ideas of what she might have? Yell it out. I can't hear you. Could be a good oh, remedy, remedy yes. but what's the diagnosis? What's the disease? Cholera. Yeah. Good, good. So it was me on my birthday, that's why. <laughs> From the aforementioned I dishwasher, ground dishwasher. Yeah, I don't know how I got it. I really don't. Anyway, it's seriously awful. Um, Vibrio cholera, yay! 20 liters of rice water, re diarrhea, straight up. Like, I don't think I had that much, but man, holy Toledo. Half of people had vomiting. I got vomiting, yes. And two thirds are asymptomatic. I wasn't asymptomatic. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, it was rough. Um, so it's spread by poor hygiene, contaminated water sources, and they've now determined that Haiti's issue was brought in by the Nepalese United Nations base. However, it's also interesting, not to get all political on you, but the president at the time owned the sanitation company that the United Nations had hired to take away their waste. And instead of dumping it properly, they dumped it into the Artibonite River. So yes, it came from Nepal, but it was really the president's fault. So, interesting, huh? Conspiracy. Um, and now over 5,000 people have passed away. It's really terrible. Does anyone know the mechanism? Why cholera is so bad so quickly and how it happens? Does anybody know? You have a pathology test tomorrow, right? Is this on it? Micro. It's actually simpler than that. The, the sodium chloride channel in the gut actually gets reversed, so the water follows sodium, right? So you're dumping sodium into the lumen of your gut, water's following it at a really rapid rate, and all of the water's coming out of your body faster than you can get it in. And so that's why people were passing away within like 12 hours of, of onset of symptoms. Um, and when you, when you dump sodium and chloride from the poop, what's your acid-base physiology? What happens? You go into acidosis. How do you get rid of acid? Breathe and... Puke it up. So it's a compensatory vomiting, actually. But the other thing to know about the mechanism that this is an infection. You're not in just ingesting the cholera toxin. Like your classic potato salad, Staph aureus thing. The Staph aureus has already made the toxin. You could cook the crap out of that potato salad and it wouldn't make a difference. This is an infection. So the people in the tent camps got it, left, and maybe a day or two later felt sick and that's when they started pooping. So that's how it spread so quickly, and it's just everywhere in Haiti right now. I don't really remember a lot of the treatment because I was delusional, but um, yeah, apparently Sorry. you could give zinc, <laughs> homeopathy, probiotics, and gut killers. Uh, no, I'm kidding. But the, the main thing, you don't need IVs, you don't need meds, really. You just need oral rehydration solution. If you can get that person to drink enough water, they're going to be fine. 
but the problem is if they can't drink, then they might need an IV. We also did some rectal IVs when we couldn't, they, they couldn't drink and their, their veins had collapsed due to dehydration. Just cut the, end off, the needle off and insert it into the rectum and do a very, very slow drip and then that will help them to get a little bit of water in and then you could maybe do an IV after that when their veins pop up a bit. So um, yeah, get water in as much as you can, not just water, but since you're dumping the sodium and the chloride, you have to add other things into it, other electrolytes. And this is a cholera specific oral rehydration solution. There are others out there, but this is the recipe that you need. So it's a half a teaspoon of salt with eight of sugar, or you can use flour if that's all you have. So we would give these to moms. Um, if we were worried that it might be cholera, we would give them you know, directions to either call us or we would call them. We would exchange a cell phone number, give them the oral rehydration solution or the recipe, and then tell them, you know, if you see this, if you see any lethargy, if they're just not getting better, you need to get them to the treatment center right away and make sure that they knew, you know, that it could be bad really quickly. Um, does anyone know why emergency is not appropriate for cholera? Yeah, it has electrolytes, but... What's it? Yeah, right, What's it missing? exactly. Right, it has said sodium, it. some. Not enough. It doesn't have chloride in it. And, chloride, and the chloride yeah. channels are what's poisoned. So, so. shoot. Um, vomiting. Apparently, Sean gave me both promethazine and undead citron. I can't say it. I don't really remember. Um, you can also give Cipro, azithromycin, or doxycycline at those doses. Um, what do you think about giving antidiarrheal meds? in this situation? Yes or no? Yeah, you do want it out. But at the same time, if they're getting so dehydrated, it's something to maybe consider. So you need to kind of walk that line and do an individual case-by-case -case analysis of your patient. And I already talked about IV rehydration, so. And the meds go in that order. Oops. You have to get the vomiting under control first or they can't keep anything else down. So if they're not really down and out, you might try NUX first. If that doesn't work, then try promethazine and zofrin. Also, normally Sean wouldn't be treating me, but in Haiti, he was the doctor, so. No one else there. So. All right, scalp Ethics. rashes. Okay, we're gonna play a little matching game. So your four diseases are tinea capitis, seborrheic dermatitis, empatigo, and we don't know what they were, OMG pustules. They were these massive quarter-sized things all over kids' heads, just everywhere. Like, what is that? Okay. All right. So um, what's, what's tinea capitis? Let's get all on the same page. It's a fungus, right? Good. What about seborrheic dermatitis? Yeah, it's that kind of itchy dandruff. Like malassezia furfurs with it, you know, that kind of thing. Impetigo, what's that? Yep. Or Uncrusted lesions. It, it depends. The bolus, they, they actually switch developed countries um, more so on the strep, non developed more so on the staph. But what really complicates this is when a kid gets an itchy scalp. They start scratching. And now you've got the oh my god pustules. <laughs> and maybe you've got tinea under it and you don't know. It's just a big mess of infection. So. so causes poor hygiene again, malnutrition, their immune systems maybe not strong enough to fight off these infections. Dirty razors. Every male in Haiti goes to the barber shop to get his hair cut and they're all very short and they do it on a regular basis. And maybe they're not cleaning the razors so then everyone's getting ringworm, everyone's getting you know, this and that, everything. So, all right. So which treatment would be appropriate for tinea? Good. What about seborrheic dermatitis? Good. What about impetigo? Yep. And then what about OMG pustules? It's in order. That helps you out. Easiest test you'll ever take. And these are kind of, I put these in order of like least invasive to most invasive. For a really crazy case of pustules, I'm not waiting for that to go systemic. I'm not waiting for that to really hurt a kid. I might give the silica, but I'm also probably going to give at least a topical, you know, like Neosporin or something like that. Neosporin actually is quite effective for impetigo. In the United States, you'll probably 
give, and again, failing like homeopathy and all that other stuff, a really bad case, you might give mupirocin topically, which you know to give for MRSA infections, carriers in the nose. It's really expensive, and actually the triple antibiotic works just as well. So there are a couple cases of just a really mild impetigo that I wanted to get out of there. They had a lot of URI symptoms from it, and I just gave a little bit of Neosporin like twice a day, and it cleared it up. So Meds um, are not necessarily evil. Sorry. Getting back to thinking outside the box, since we're on derm, it, we had these patients that would come in with a rash, and it was just sort of a contact dermatitis, and we're like, where is this all coming from? Because it seemed like everyone had it. We realized that they were washing with laundry soap because they would just go buy laundry soap to wash their clothes and then they'd wash their bodies with it as well. And that's so drying to the skin. And the more, if they had a rash, they would wash maybe five times a day or at least twice a day. Every Haitian washes at least twice a day. They're very, very clean. It's, I mean, we were so dirty compared to everyone else. <laughs> but so it's important to think outside the box because it's maybe not some big infection. Maybe they're just washing with laundry soap and we would give them a bar of soap and it would go away. So. That took us a long time to realize. Okay, this is one of our favorite, sweet, amazing patients. We won't give you her real name. Um, but this is a case of impetigo. And we first came in, and I, we both thought she, had, she was a burn victim because she had just, it was like her skin had just been peeled off. And we're like, what happened to her? And the mom's like, it just happened a few days ago. I don't know. She just started getting this little lesion, and then it spread. Um... This kiddo has, she's from a family where we don't think dad's in the picture. There's not a lot of food. So she, her immune system's not that great. She can't fight off infections. Anyway, we got it cleared up. Um, we pretty much did antibiotics because it was so severe, I believe, right? Did we, did the we first give, time. The first this time. is actually the, the second time that okay. she had it. The first time I wrote a blog about it called Why We Fight and um, kind of detailed how we went through that. Um, in this one, she came back and was just, boom, all over again. Yeah, and it had gone away getting, completely. Yeah, and she had and been getting a lot of respiratory things. She's just kind of a sickly child. She was anemic. We actually had some blood work on her. We thought she might have HIV, which the hospital didn't test for, even though we asked. So maybe she still does. She didn't quite qualify for medical mamba, which was a bummer. but. Um, so yeah, go ahead. Yeah, because you so saw her the second time. Yeah, the top two picture. It's really hard to see with the sliding, but when you get the slides, you'll be able to see better. The top two pictures are the before, and the bottom two are the after. Was that me? Sorry. Um, oh, my hair. Septa, Sorry. take my word for it that it's way better in the second set of pictures. Um, she had weeping open lesions and fissures on the back of her neck that we were really worried we were going to get infected and go even further downhill. So this time we actually did homeopathy. Um, we gave her Merck because I had, I had narrowed down to like four different remedies. But then what tipped me over was that when I went to do the exam, you can't see here, but she has blackened areas on her teeth that were new. They had only... Oh, yes. Yeah, thank you. Go, Jennifer. Oh, because of the camera. Okay. Maybe temporarily. So you saw the black teeth? No? Okay. Um, that was actually a bold for Merck. So I gave Merck. Um, I did another quick diet diary to see what had changed. Sorry, Merck. Mercurius. Homeopathic 30C. Um, I had her dose it daily. And I noticed in her diet diary she didn't have any meat whatsoever. So I actually put her on some B12 in addition to zinc and vitamin C to help that skin heal up. Um, she had already been given vitamin A recently, so I didn't think it would be prudent to give her more. And this is actually the first follow-up, and when we left, Xenia again saw her and sent us more pictures, and she's clear. Way better. So, um, usually for something like this, I would give antimonium carb, not tart, carb, for like a really itchy impetigo, but um, she responded beautifully, so we just kind of stayed the course on that treatment because at least one of those things was really seeming to be what she was missing. So. Vaginal infections, or is it? Okay, so the first thing that we needed to find out, or that we, one of our learning curve 
issues was, do your, does your patient know where her vagina is? Because some of ours didn't really. And so there was a big question of, is this a vaginal infection? Is this a UTI? Is this, you know, is it actually pain or is it itching? And sometimes those words would be interchanged, lost in translation. So it was very difficult without being able to do a pelvic exam, you know, and, and using a, a microscope to diagnose different things. It was hard to just, you know, we just had to, had to diagnose based on the history. Um, and so what do they mean by infection again? Is the irritation inside or outside? All of those things. Uh, obviously, you'd consider candida, BV, trick, and gonorrhea, chlamydia as your main things. We didn't have a lot of treatment options available, so we learned this from one of the first midwives who came down. Who was it? I don't know. I don't think they're in this room. Anyway, um, a garlic badge pack is what we ended up calling it. So garlic was readily available. We would have the woman in the morning, we'd give her a probiotic to take, and at night she would insert a clove of garlic into the vagina and then take it out in the morning. And then the next day, take a probiotic, insert a clove of garlic into the vagina, do that for four days, and then on the fifth day, continue to take a probiotic and insert a probiotic on the fifth, sixth, and seventh nights. And almost every case of vaginal infections, whatever the cause was, was, was cleared up. If it wasn't, we would consider metronidazole because it was probable that it was gonorrhea chlamydia, um, and it would just help to clear it up. And that was really just because we didn't have as many options as we would have here, like vitamin A suppositories, all of those lovely things. Um, there is, you want to talk about the metro? Oh, yeah, if, if you, um, there's a newer black box warning on metronidazole, which I saw some people like posted on Facebook, oh, meds are evil, look, it gives you cancer. Um, it was a small, poorly done animal study, like way back in the 80s, that has not been reproduced. And human studies have shown no increased risk of cancer with, like you would be giving a short, very short duration of metronidazole, so don't be too freaked out about that. It can clear easily a good case of trick or gonorrhea or chlamydia, which could cause a lot of problems. Um, so don't be, don't be too afraid of it. It is one that has a lot more GI side effects, a lot more candida. So again, you're going to give probiotics. You're going to be smart about it. Another cool little tidbit about the Saccharomyces boulardii is because it's a fungus, it's not going to be affected by, by antibiotics, except for, I mean, the antifungals, obviously. So um, you could give it during antibiotic treatment, prevent C. diff and all that. Um, if it is UTI, you can consider cranberry, cantharis, or ca homeopathic causticum. Um, who knows why cranberry is effective in UTIs? Anybody? Yeah, it basically makes it slippery so that their little feet can't hold on, and then you just pee them out. So lots of water and cranberry can work wonders. Or blueberry, that could work as well if you don't have cranberry. Malnutrition. Um, the big two, I would say are marasmus, which is the child will be skin and bones. It's caused by just a general gross malnutrition. They don't have enough calories, period. They have, they're very, very thin. Um, they sometimes have a big belly, thinning hair. Um, it's obvious that it's been going on a long time if they're at this stage. Quasher core is their skin, bones, and water, so they have swelling. They'll have really puffy cheeks. Um, they'll have swelling on their hands and feet sometimes. It usually starts with the feet, and then it'll go to the hands if it's even more severe. They, ha they will get red hair sometimes. You'll see little kids with coppery hair, and they pretty much always have quashing core, or they dye their hair, maybe. Am I doing that again? I'm not used to having long hair, you guys. I'm really not. <laughs> I don't know where it is. They're often really irritable, kind of lethargic and irritable little children. They usually don't have enough protein. They might be getting, you know, pasta and rice and some things in, but just not the right things. Um, it decreases their neurotransmitters, just causes lots of issues. So they need food. It's, it's a really easy fix by our standards, but it's a massive, massive problem around the world. Um, and then we talked about the Medica Mamba, and this is a really great solution for it. Did you want to talk about anything else on that slide? No, well, there's an easy screen. Um, you can measure the um, upper arm circumference, and that can give you an easy screen to see if you should investigate further, or you really should be weighing and measuring the kids. And for Medica Mamba, is if they were below the third, below three standard deviations for weight versus height, then 
that's how they would be admitted. And then when they got up to within one standard deviation, that's when they would be discharged. Well, they could be admitted with two or three, but it was just a matter of how severe they were. Yeah, and then if yeah. they had severe swelling or something like that, they might need to be inpatient. But. And the thing about Quashicor is when you start to refeed them, they'll start they'll lose weight initially. So it's kind of scary because you don't want, you're, you're like, you cannot lose any more weight, but they're just getting rid of all the water and then they'll start to build up a little bit. Worms, we saw so many worms. <laughs> um, yeah, kind of gross, huh? That guy's creepy. <laughs> there, we actually had this really classic picture from our micro class that was oh, man. very graphic. I and I thought that. about putting it no. in there at SCNM, but then we realized no one after us would have had that guy, so they wouldn't kind of get the joke. So it was, I went for another creepy one. It looked like one. spaghetti. It was, it was just the worst picture ever. Yeah, so yeah. Why, why worms? It might be a, a chief complaint that comes in. And in Haiti, they have many different explanations for why their child has worms. Maybe it's because he grinds his teeth. That's it. Or he just spits a lot. Must have worms. Sometimes it was, it was more like we saw worms in the poop. Well, that's pretty easy. Um, but there's kind of this council of old people who tell everybody what they have. And then they come in, and they're like, treat me for worms. And you're like, you don't have worms. That's not the problem. So you're kind of at odds, but you're not wanting to spread misinformation. So you have to, again, kind of walk that line. Um, so here are a couple different kinds of worms. And where there is no doctor breaks this down really nicely. And I kind of just added some observations, but stole the rest from them on here. So um, round worms, ascariasis would be the condition, are big, round, and white. You can see them in the poop. They might have a cough. And the really gross reason is that you'll eat um, you know, the eggs or the worms. They'll go through your bloodstream, into your lungs, hatch, crawl out of your lungs, and then you swallow them. And that's how you get infected. So they might have this cough. Isn't so if sick? they come in, they've got a really big belly and a cough. Oh, that's gross. Um, treat them. If, they, uh, if they're having a new onset vomiting, Danger Will Robinson, they might have an obstruction. I think the, the kid who vomited when I went to touch his belly had an obstruction, so I actually sent him for that. It's a different treatment for that. You give um, piperazine, yeah, which is actually like kind of nebulous. It's a kind of a class of medicines, um, and that will help to paralyze the worms. So you're not trying to purge just a big old clump of wiggling worms. Um, that can be dangerous. Tapeworms or tinea spread through basically undercooked meat. There are different ones for beef and pork and all that. Um, longer, segmented, flat. Patients can tell you this stuff. They can, they can see those worms and tell you what they are. What you're worried about are little kids, and again, they can have the cough really nasty. Um, you're worried about kids who scratch their butt because you're pooping out cysts. And the cysts are kind of before eggs. And usually you're going to eat eggs in the meat. But the cysts can, if you ingest them, again, kid, little kids are nasty. <laughs> eat the cysts, goes up to your brain, you get neurocysticercosis. So, um, a child with new onset seizures, you're very suspicious for that. This was on Grey's Anatomy, and they had this really awful CGI thing where McDreamy went in with like the robot, and he was like trying to grab the worm, and it's really nasty and unrealistic. But, but neurocysticercosis. So Call a matters. specialist with that one. Seizures may be dead. <laughs> Hookworm, um, small, uh, reddish. You usually won't see them in the poop. The most insidious thing about them is that you get anemia, and usually kids will just start kind of dropping off in school. It's the most common cause of that happening in the developing world. And this is actually more common in barefoot hippies than the rest of the population because they are in the dirt, and then you walk around and get dirt on your feet, and they actually come in through your feet, and then go, it goes through the same mechanism, getting into your lungs, they hatch, cough it up, and then you swallow it. So... Don't wear, be, or be sure to wear shoes in Haiti. Think about that as you're eating your like gluten-free cupcakes and stuff. <laughs> the world is a very gross place. Whipworms are very similar to roundworms, but a bit smaller. Um, you're suspicious if you get a kid with rectal prolapse. That's 
in Haiti at least, probably whipworms, and so you would treat accordingly. A quick tip that I got in, in um, that worked for two kids that I saw in uh, Where There's No Doctor is to flip them upside down and put cold water on their butt, and then it pulls it back in, and that totally worked. And I did that and treated the kid for worms. No, 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 it's just like flip no. them and pour it. It's kind of like hydrotherapy, like reflexively vasoconstrict, that kind of thing. I don't know, but um, this, this mom was ranting and raving because this kid had like weeks of rectal prolapse and turned it right around. Um, for all these, basically, I mean, they're like some meds are maybe slightly better sometimes. Albendazole is the main role. You can single dose it. In Haiti, there's a program every six months to give albendazole prophylactically. Um, and then WERBS, which the formula is in the clinical crash course. Again, not like all inclusive, it's just what we had like garlic, ginger, jugglings, that kind of thing. So. We should speed up. We've been talking we to you for a long up. time. Faster. You want to do it or should I? I'll do it. Go ahead. Um, malaria. Anyone know the pattern of the fevers in malaria? It's kind of a trick question. There are a couple different patterns. Yes, like this. Um, one of them, like Vivax or something, is two day, every two days, and one's every three days. Falsoparum just goes up and kills you. So that's no good. Um, in a fever of unknown origin in a kid in Haiti, I, I'm jumping to malaria. Like, I'm treating them as if, because it's so common and it can be really big trouble for them. Um, they might have mild abdominal pain, really mild cough, but nothing that you could be like, oh, they have a flu and that's why they have the fever. They'll maybe get hepatosplenomegaly, maybe be jaundiced. It kind of hangs out in your liver, causes problems. Um, spread by mosquitoes, you're going to treat with permethrin-treated nets, prevent with permethrin-treated nets, which will actually reduce the mosquito population. Um, water sources, all that. That's how the Panama Canal was built the second time around, was they figured out mosquitoes were what was spreading yellow fever and killing everybody. Fish, we had frogs in our pool, tadpoles, because uh, we didn't have the pool completely done yet. And they were, I, I never saw a mosquito larva there once, and I think the tadpoles were eating it. Larva. In the pool. In the pool. But tons of tadpoles. And we had a lot of frogs, and it was really noisy at night. So. Haitians are afraid of frogs. Terrified. I don't have time for that story. I feel, kind of feel bad about it, but it's really funny. Uh, bats, not really. Um, usually in areas with a lot of mosquitoes, the bats don't eat those mosquitoes. Um, but look into your area, maybe make a bat cave to, I don't know. Um, Artemisia annua is also known as sweet wormwood or sweet annie is a good herb for treating a milder malaria. Artemisinin is extracted from it and is now standard adjuvant therapy in malaria if there's resistance. There's very little resistance in Haiti, so they just give chloroquine. Um, don't mess around with this too much. This was actually the start of homeopathy, if you remember. Hahnemann was on the ship, and everybody's getting malaria or whatever, and he gave uh, China, right? So, food for thought. Next. Elephantiasis. This is just a cool one. We only saw it like two cases, but um, yeah, basically you get this worm lodges into a lymph channel. It tends to be in lower extremities or scrotum and uh, prevents lymph flow, so it just backs up, and so the limb just gets enormous. So you have to kill the worm. Much better outcome if you treat it earlier. The gold standard is ivermectin and DEC, which you can't get DEC in the United States, but if you've read research in the last six years, doxycycline works a lot better and is a much simpler treatment, less toxic. Um, I think you give like six weeks, yeah, 85%. If it's been there for a while, it's not going to be so effective. Also about your naturopathic stuff, your lymphagogues, hydrotherapy. There's surgery for removing the worm if it's very severe. It's kind of cool. I like that. Um, yeah. Next. Oh. Oh, we took out that last slide. So we want to talk a little bit about the future. Um, we are going to kind of regroup in the United States. We've moved from Haiti, we'll be hanging out in East Bay, California for a while, looking for the next project, basically helping out with Natural Pass Without Borders. 
Um, Mama Baby will continue operating. They've got Santo, who is being trained pretty soon for becoming a community health worker. He'll be the first one. He'll help to follow up on the new moms, help to follow up when we have maybe a case of malaria, and we send them home with a thermometer to make sure that they actually have a fever and that it's actually breaking and coming back, all that kind of stuff. We've already started training him in triage. Xenia's been training him in some basic exams. You know, a lot of this stuff, you go to school for four years, but it's not rocket science. I think um, we had a lot of our first year students doing full intakes by the time their week was up, and I think that's a really valuable experience. Um, and then the rest is, is kind of up to you. So I'm really interested in hearing what you all would like to do with your careers. I hope you'll consider a career at least part-time in, in global health, at least like a week a year or something like that. I think everybody could do that. And that would really help. If, if we had enough of those docs, if we had 52 of those docs, we could fully staff a clinic, you know? Think about that. So um, love to talk to you uh, after, or you can email us. I can write our email addresses slide. on the board. Yeah, oh God. Blackboard, that's cool. Just don't get creepy, okay? <laughs> don't stalk us too much. Uh, I will do my best to answer every email and whatever questions you have. I'm happy to hook you up with different people in the global health community or whatnot. Um, in August, we will be at AANP, and there will be a Naturopaths Without Borders trip to Rocky Point as always open to all students, but we're actually really trying to target all students because they'll be there for A&P in Phoenix. They'll be the weekend before that. You're gonna wanna get in on that early. I don't know if they've actually kind of launched signups on that, but keep an eye out for that on the Natch Pass Without Borders Facebook. There are, yeah. Can you read those? There's a dot there. For yeah, mine. there's a dot Sean here, dot Sean Hessler. Dot Hessler. Uh, yeah, that's basically it. It's really what you make of it. Um, don't listen to the fear mongers who tell you you can't make a career in global health. You can. I it's wanna, hard, but oh. probably easier than private practice anyway. So. I want to introduce some special people real quick. I'll just take a couple more minutes of your time. We have, we're fortunate to have a couple of the Mama Baby board members here with us. Um, two wonderful women, Patricia Couch and Jennifer Gallardo. Um, so if you have any questions, I don't know if you guys have time, but... We can, anyway, we can put you in touch with them if they don't have time to chat with you tonight. But if you want to go down and volunteer, it's a really great, amazing place. So um, they're the ones who started it all. We also have Patricia some... Patricia has volunteer forms, too, if you want to sign up. We also have some past Mama Baby volunteers. Jessica, Kim, Alan, and Kelly. Would you guys raise your hands? Sorry to put you on the spot. Um, so if you want to know what it's like to go down there and volunteer, you can talk with them or us. Yes. Yeah, Absolutely. someday. Yeah. We lo I mean, Haiti just, it's a really special place. It really captures your heart. And, you know, it, all the volunteers can tell you that who've been there. And, and the board members can tell you that. It's just. When we get the solar right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we just 5000 bucks for a solar and, just so and battery awesome. backup system. It's, it's going to make great. a big difference. Don't have to deliver babies with a headlamp, like, in pitch dark. <laughs> It is. Possible. You also don't need a translator, which I didn't believe, but you don't. 